All right, there we are. Yay. Hello. Welcome. Welcome to today's webinar. I am super excited because I have my fabulous friend Lucy Brazier with me today. <laughs> and in just a few minutes, I'm going to tell you about Lucy. But look at all of you coming in on the chat from Canada, Washington, California, all over the place. It's so great to see all of you. So yes, please say hello. And this way, Lucy could also see where you are coming in from. Spain, Lucy, uh, the other oh. Spain on there. Lucy just got <laughs> back from Spain not too long ago. <laughs> so welcome to a global perspective of the administrative profession. I'm Joan Burge, founder and CEO of Office Dynamics International. We are a global leader in the development and presentation of sophisticated training programs and information for administrative professionals. And we've been doing that for 30 years. This is our 30 year anniversary. So it's, it's pretty exciting. And wow, uh, when I think about 30 years, certainly have been a lot of changes in the administrative profession. And now we're going through this, this whole new world as we started the 2020. And, uh, today is going to be a very important conversation, and Lucy is going to shed a lot of light for you. And our goal is to uplift you, inspire you, and educate you. So, uh, and I'm confident we'll accomplish that. A couple logistics first. The learning part of the session will be about 40 minutes, followed by Q and A. So, Lucy is ready to take all kinds of questions today. And you could submit your questions anytime during the program. Um, in the lower right hand part there, there's a, a little icon down there that you can click on and submit your question. And then Malia will pull those and have those ready for Lucy later in the webinar. What else? If you have technical issues, the only support we can give you is through the chat. And you will receive a replay link following today's webinar. So um, before I tell you the, the formal headings and titles for Lucy, I'm doing my own description for a minute, Lucy. So when I think of Lucy Brazier, I think of the woman who never sleeps. I swear, I don't think she ever sleeps. She travels the world and is passionate about this profession. So if I had, to, if I had to tie it all up, that's how I view her. Um, now for the formal part, she is the CEO of Marcham Publishing. She is publisher of Executive Secretary Magazine, which is an awesome um, magazine. I love it. It's always packed with great information, useful information. Lucy has presented and emceed events in over 50 countries. Like I said, I don't know how she does it. <laughs> I tend to stick to the United States <laughs> and she's certainly qualified to give us a global perspective. So welcome, Lucy. Yay. Oh, hi, Joe. It's so Thank wonderful. To be I've been so looking forward to this. I think it's just, it's so wonderful to be invited on. So thank you for the invite. Oh, you're welcome. I am so glad you're here. Um, so we're just going to dive in because I know you have a lot to share today. So I know, well, one thing to give them background, you and I and some of the other uh, administrative thought leaders, we've been having a lot of conversations since COVID started and we've all been trying to keep an eye on everything and be proactive and being able to deliver uh, information for assistance. So. Um, my first question is, what are you actually seeing, you know, in the profession, especially since the, the pandemic started? Yeah, I think it's quite important to key it up, really, so that you have the background, because actually some of the stuff that's happened in the past is really relevant. And I think that giving you a picture of that kind of builds to where we are now. And, you know, if you've heard me speak before, you will know that I always talk about 10 years ago and the recession that happened then and the fact that that was the real game changer for the assistants out there because what it meant 10 years ago when Lehman's went bang and businesses let go of all their middle management was that you then stepped up and took on a lot of the middle management tasks. So we find that now we have 87% of assistants doing 
um, events. It's about 53% of you doing HR. There's a whole heap of you doing finance or marketing or PR, whatever. And from that, what we found was that the majority of you were taking on about 20% more work than you had before. But obviously, because like now, so many of you were being let go initially, you were scared for your jobs. So you did it without any training and without any more remuneration. So let's roll forward a little bit then. And let's talk about what we've been um, training over the last couple of years, which is that we are right in the middle now of the fourth industrial revolution. And what that means is that we're looking at a lot more digitalization. We're looking at robots taking over a lot of work. And if you saw that terrible article in the Wall Street Journal a few months back, um, you know, there's a lot of questions about whether the assistant profession would survive at all, the administrative profession, which I think is total and utter nonsense. Um, and in fact, the facts in that article were completely wrong. She had only gone and looked at one segment of the Department of Labor's figures. And the Department of Labor, I don't know if you are aware, but only has one category for administrators, and it tends to be the lower level. And in fact, there's a lot of campaigning going on right now in order to elevate that and make sure that there is a senior EA level in there, um, because that then gives us a benchmark and a touch point when we're talking to HR directors as to what you should all be paid. But that's something else I'm going to come on to in a moment. But what actually is the case is that, yes, if all you are doing is task-based things, so if you are doing repetitive tasks, if something can be repeated in the same way twice, then yes, it can be automated. And yes, AI, artificial intelligence, will eventually take that over. In fact, they're saying by 2025, 48% of work will be done by human beings and 52% will be done by robots. So we have to be mindful of that. And even before COVID struck, I had 58% of you telling me on our latest survey that you were feeling underutilized and that you didn't know how to have those conversations with your executives. So what does that mean? Well, to me, what it means is that assistants that want to stay ahead of the game and want to be recognized within their business as adding value and contributing uh, return on investment to the business, which let's face it is what you're all hoping to do, need to be picking up not the um, repetitive tasks and the reactive tasks, but proactive work. So projects and uh, writing reports for your executive and maybe putting together um, briefing documents and stopping thinking about yourselves as, as gatekeepers of people and starting to think of yourselves as gatekeepers of time because that's what you're employed to do. You're employed by your executives. Well, you're employed by your businesses, actually. Let's, let's just get that straight. You're employed by your businesses, not by your executives. So your, execu your executive is the person that you're employed to make sure that they are the best that they can possibly be. So you are taken on by your business because your executive is paid a lot of money to make sure that the money they're spending on them is best spent. And to that end, you should be looking at all the things that you can take away from them. How do you add value? How do you take on greater responsibility? Not more work, by the way, value and responsibility so that your business can see that you are of value. Now, how does that all change again with COVID? I actually think it's a huge opportunity. I think I know my timeline is full right now of those of you that have been let go, and we're gonna come on to that later. And I totally, totally understand the uncertainty and the problems around that. But what I would say to you is, we have been fighting for 10 years and Joan for 30 years, and God bless you, Joan, I, for forging away for the rest of us. But you know, we've been fighting for 10 years to not just get you a seat at the table, but to get you to be part of the conversation. And actually, all of a sudden, we're in this situation whereby you are either being 
underutilized because you're not quite sure what you should be doing. And a lot of you are saying to me, Lucy, I really am concerned because they're not giving me any work to do. And I'm saying to them, please give me work to do. And they're going, well, go do whatever it is you're meant to do. Let me explain that to you for two seconds. Your executives are in as great a panic and uncharted waters in most cases as you are. They've never done this before either. So where they're sitting right now is in a position where they're trying to reinvent the wheel and trying to work out in some cases how to save their businesses. So they don't have time to start thinking about what your job is. You need to sit there and think, where can I add value? And think about metaphorically a huge pile of papers in front of that executive and to be sifting it through with them to say, well, I can take that and I can take that. You guys are the chaos tamers. You're the guys who come up with the process and the procedure. That's what you're brilliant at. So go do it. Take all that chaos and turn it into procedure and process so that your executives know exactly the value that you are adding. The other side of the coin is that I've got assistants who very much like the last recession are tearing your hair out because you have so much work to do. And in a lot of cases, you're trying to juggle that with working from home and with kids and homeschooling and all that stuff. And if that's the case, you know, <laughs> there need to be some boundaries put in place. There needs to be some kind of respect for the hours that you actually work and how you're able to do that. And again, it's about having those conversations. So I think this is a period of time where actually, if you step up and you shine, you could get that seat at the table that you've wanted. Do you know what I think is really interesting is the number of assistants who are saying to me, I'm really liking the whole Zoom thing because it totally takes out of the um, equation that body language piece. You know, when you're sitting around a table in the boardroom and the executive walks in and sits at the head of the table and all the body language is deferential or when the marketing director walks in and she isn't really a very nice person and she sweeps in and she uses her power by body language. All that's gone because we're now all in the same size boxes and actually a lot of assistants are saying that it's giving them their opportunity to step up and to have conversations which make them uncomfortable but I have to say I think right now if you're being comfortable you're probably not in the right place you've got to get comfortable with being uncomfortable and it's going to be that way for a little while if you're comfortable I think you're probably reactive and you're doing tasks so you need to push yourself I'm going to draw breath now and let Joan say something. <laughs> Thank you, Beth. Well, I've been taking notes because, um, and I know even though I have our little list of questions here, but of course, as you speak, you know, you're making me, um, I'm thinking about some other things too. So we, we may go off here a little bit. Um, Lucy. Please do. First of all, I love that you said chaos tamers. Love that. Um, ditto on the boundaries. I think that's extremely important um, with the working from home. And now that so many of you uh, or assistants are going to have to be doing this, the learning, you know, being, <laughs> I have one assistant the other day, she's got three kids that she's going to have to take care of uh, with schooling this year. And she said, I'm sorry, I wasn't really taught how to be a teacher. And she is a overly busy executive assistant for a vice president. So she's like, all right, now I've got to add that to my list. So I agree with Lucy 100%. And I was a working mother. You know, I worked since my kids were three months old. I, I never really stopped. Um, I just love being a career woman. But even then, even when I was going to the office, but coming home and having a lot of responsibilities, you still have to set boundaries and delegate to your kids. I mean, to me, as you're, when you, if your kids are old enough to start emptying the dishwasher and cleaning their room and do the laundry, you do not have to be doing that. And I think, you know, I know I'm kind of going off here, Lucy, but I think this is important as well, is women, which 97% of assistants are female, feeling that obligation that, well, I've got to do it all, right? And that puts a lot of added extra stress and pressure there uh, totally is. And I think, Jane, what's really interesting is that there's a lot of research out there at the moment, not necessarily in the administrative profession, but which is saying that 
women are going to come out the other end of this not in a good way because it's reverting to the way that it used to be where men are there doing the work and the women are trying to support rather than driving their own careers forward and i saw one particularly which i found horrifying which was about academics which was saying that already the number of women submitting papers versus men is down absolutely massively because the men are being spe given space to continue and the women are not um, and I think that's really important. I think, you know, the way we do it is we time block everything. And if you don't know about time blocking, there's an amazing article in the Harvard Business Review, which I will forward you the link to, Joan, so that you can send it out. But, ba but basically, in my calendar, I, I don't like to do lists. I have a to do list, but on a weekly basis, I sit there and I go, OK, so what are the things I have to accomplish this week? And then they get time blocked into my calendar. But so does breakfast. So does my two hour walk every day. So does having dinner with my husband in the evening. So does, you know, watching a TV show that I really want to watch a couple of times a week so that I don't end up feeling utterly overwhelmed with everything that I have to do and so that I find I do have space for my family. And as somebody that has worked from home for the last 10 years, and Matt, my assistant, also works remotely, so we're very rarely in the same office, I can tell you that the real secret is A, to plan it in that amount of detail, but B, to keep communication lines open with your team and with your executive. Because I think that where there are problems with assistants and executives, it's always about communication. So it's about meeting regularly. And I know that Joan and I both believe in having daily huddles, even if it's just 10 minutes a day to catch up on what the things are since yesterday. So you make sure that you are working out exactly what the priorities are. And you know, you can cover a huge amount in 10 minutes if it is an everyday meeting. And I don't believe Matt can look after me properly unless he, Matt's my assistant, by the way. Um, I don't think he can look after me properly unless he understands on a daily basis what that those priorities are. So if I don't have those meetings, he can't get on with his job. And I know a lot of you go, oh, oh, oh Lucy, yes, I know, but I get taken off the calendar all the time. Well, yeah, do you or do you take yourself off the calendar? Because actually I talked to um, <laughs> four really senior CEOs quite recently at an event. And you guys had all said to me, Lucy, please ask them about being taken off the calendar because we want a meeting with them and they won't have it and they keep putting it off. Mm -hmm. And when I said to them, they want to know how they stay on the calendar, they all blinked at me. And then they smiled and they said, yes, but they, don't they look after the calendar? <laughs> you know and and I know exactly what they mean because actually if I have my team in my office which is very very rare but if I do people come in we have a meeting they go out again they come in we have a meet if Matt arrives I don't think why is he here he shouldn't be here I just think oh Matt's here and we talk you know but it's up to him whether I'm on the calendar or not that's a good point, uh, Lucy. I think, again, it's touching on several point, good points. I love that you brought out um, the communication uh, being more critical than ever. Um, and, uh, you know, on that regular basis and the daily huddles, of course, yeah, we're big fans of that, you and I. And I feel more than ever now the daily huddles are important because I, I'm sure a lot of businesses out there are like us having to pivot and everything's changing every like moment to moment almost you know it used to be maybe you know in a day or whatever but the changes are coming so fast um and in fact when we were working from home we're back in the office now fortunately but when we were working from home i was facetiming malia a couple times a day it wasn't just the morning huddle like as things were arising and I prefer get on FaceTime or Zoom because I want to see your face and I want to, I want, I don't want to be texting and that kind of thing, right? That's the communication, talking to each other, get that clarification, get it figured out, nail it down and move forward. So we found we were actually doing it more. Um, and, and I really would like to uh, us to encourage the assistants who are with us today to be very adamant. And Lucy, I feel again, you said something very important when you said they take themselves off the calendar. Um, 
and I'm sure you can build on this, Lucy, but sometimes when I'm teaching assistants about the daily huddles and why they're important, I'll hear, well, my executive's just too busy. I mean, they don't have time for me. They're really busy people. And my first thought is you don't value yourself enough because you're um, like, you would, not, you would not say that. Like you are the one running their life. You are the one managing everything. If if no one else gets on the calendar, it should be you. So yeah. maybe you Shall could speak we? to that. Uh, you have to watch your language as an assistant and not say my executive's too busy to me or Yes, I think it's interesting. I'm watching the chat and I think it's very interesting watching the comments come up and I, I'm hearing you and I'm hearing your pain at being taken off calendars because yes, some of you are being and that's because right now they're, you know, <laughs> just so busy. But let me let me just boil it down for you, okay? Because it's about your executives understanding your value and you also understanding your value. And when it works, and you work in partnership properly, it's like one of you breathes out and the other one breathes in. And it's like there is one whole person. And I am going to go into that in not too much detail, but I do just want to explain it to you because I think it's really, really important that you understand what you are there to do, okay? And I talked a bit earlier about gatekeepers of time, but what I'm saying to you is, your executives are absolutely phenomenal at certain things, and rubbish at others. And there are things that you are absolutely amazing at that they are terrible at. Yes, and, and, and you couldn't do probably quite a lot of what they do. So let me explain that. I'm going to use very quickly a psychometric testing system that I train on, which is called Belbin. And Belbin talks about where you sit in a team. And basically what Meredith Belbin said is that in the ideal team, you have eight different types of people. And what's really interesting is that the assistants fall into three particular types and the executives fall into three totally different types. And it's a really good illustration. So the executives are either plants or they're shapers or they're resource investigators. Your plants are the people who are really cranial, really smart. They come up with new products, new systems, that type of thing, but they're not great at communicating. You know the people who sit in a high tower and they <laughs> should be handing pieces of paper down rather than actually talking to anybody because they don't know how to do that stuff. Or they are the resource investigators who are the ones who are really full of ideas and new revenue streams and they're great leaders and they drive everything forward but they can't complete and finish anything if their life depends on it they just can't dot the i's and cross the t's and do all that detail piece or they are people who are um shapers and the shapers are the ones who are you know the guys who are be quick be fast be done get out I want it done my way or the highway. I'm not interested in having conversations. So quite often, if you're assistant to them, you're trying to do the communication piece. Now, on the other side, with the assistants, what you have is you have completer finishers, who are the ones who do the dotting of I's and crossing of T's and the detail, and are the perfectionist, and quite often don't want to delegate to anybody else because they think they're the only ones who can do it. Or you have the implementers who are the people who are process and procedure led. So quite often I'll say to Matt, I've had an amazing idea. And he goes pale because he knows that he's going to be the one who has to put that detail in place. And then you also have the team workers who are the ones that smooth things over and make sure that everybody's happy and that the communication piece is done properly and that everybody understands how it works. So actually, you've got your executives over here doing their stuff and you've got you over here doing your stuff. And when you meet in the middle, it makes two sides of the coin and one complete person. And that is why the business employs you. So actually, if your executive is not allowing you to do the things that you should do, isn't meeting with you, isn't giving you their email, isn't giving you their calendar, especially right now, when businesses are requiring that their executives are freed up to go and do the things that they are phenomenal at, you're not doing your job properly. They're not allowing you to do the job. And that's why I said at the beginning, it's not your executive that employs you, it's your business. And there is a real distinction. And I honestly feel that you almost have a duty to train them because the very best of you will give your executive back 80% of their time. And that's 80% of their time that they can use to go and do sales meetings 
or seeing clients or writing proposals or coming up with plans to save the business or any of the other things that the business really needs right now. And that's why I think that COVID is such an opportunity for you, because for once you actually have an opportunity to sit there and take the bull by the horns. And here's how you do that conversation. Blame me. Tomorrow, when you pick up the phone to your executive or even later today, you say, I saw a webinar today and the woman that was talking reminded me that my role was to make sure that your time was freed up so that you can be exceptional. And I have some ideas around that. And then ask for a meeting and talk to them about it, because in that meeting, you're able to say, look, I know up until now you haven't let me do your email. I know up until now you haven't let me have your calendar. I know up until now we haven't done regular meetings. But you know what? This is critical. And we absolutely have to get this rhythm right, this communication rhythm right, so that we are able to be effective as a team. Ask them the question, what does success look like for you this month? What does success look like for you this year? What are the companies setting you as goals, as KPIs? How can I support you to get there? Because ideally, if the partnership's right, you have a common direction and a common dream, and you are working your energy in the same direction to get to where you need to be. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes a lot, a lot of sense. Thank you. And that kind of segues me into the another question we were going to talk about lucy so um those of us who are in the administrative training you know industry and education and information we've all been talking about how this is the a prime opportunity for assistants to really step up and lead and be the leaders and take the initiative to manage up don't wait for your executive and with that, I just want to add that I've had a little bit of a concern the last few, last month maybe. That is, I see assistants being left out more, they're being furloughed, and so forth. That if assistants don't step up now and truly lead and, and leverage this time, it will and can affect the profession overall because it'll be that out of sight, out of mind. So can you expand on that? This is a time of opportunity and what should they be doing? Not just really sitting there at home waiting to be told what to do, but don't waste this time, right? No, I totally, totally agree with you. And I think it is a time where you can really step up and you can assert your authority to a certain extent. And I know some of you are saying to me, well, I don't see myself as a leader. But you know what, Joan, <laughs> leadership these days is not about being out at the front and bringing everybody behind you. Leadership these days is about influence rather than authority. And it's about making sure that everybody gets home safely. And isn't that what an assistant does every single day? And, you know, there are certain skills. There is a... Um, there's a document which was produced by the World Economic Forum, which is called the Future of Jobs Report. And even before COVID, that was a really interesting document. And it sounds like it's really heavy, but actually it's not. It's really, really clear. But what's interesting on that document is it is saying that number three in the top 10 declining jobs in the next five years is going to be administrative assistance. But that, again, is like the Wall Street Journal article. Um, it's the lower level. It's the task based people. So to me, the most important thing that you can do is to really, really get to know your business. And I don't mean just knowing. I mean, really understanding. Read everything. See where you can ask questions, maybe ask to be part of your leadership meetings and not as somebody who's sitting there taking minutes. Because if you're in a leadership meeting and you're taking minutes, you can't listen. Whereas what I'm suggesting is that you are there so that you can listen. And if your executive is saying, well, why would I do that? Well, it's about listening to find out what the workloads are going to be, listening to be proactive on what's coming up that maybe you could start planning for now listening to see what your executive has agreed to so you can put timelines for that in the calendar, listening to see what other people in that meeting have agreed to so that you can chase them up on behalf of your executive, and listening to make sure that if there are projects, that the things around that project are getting delivered on time. And, you know, I think there is a great value to being the new voice in the room. 
And so many assistants are worried about that. But especially at this time, believe me, I am wonderful at what I do, but if I have to do something that is about process, I would rather spit, stick pins in my eyes. And that is why I employ Matthew, because he's brilliant at it. So, you know, in this time where everything is all over the place, just have a think for two seconds, will you, about the number of processes that are going to need to be changed within your business and how you could start looking at that, even if it's just doing the research and reading newspaper articles or looking at what other companies are doing in terms of how they're going to be structured when we come out the other end of this so that you're able to put stuff in place for your executive and say, hey, here's some information that maybe you hadn't thought of that I've gone away and I have found for you. That's what I mean by being proactive, thinking ahead, thinking, how can I make their life easier? Don't go to them with problems, go to them with solutions that you've come up with. You know, maybe surround yourself with a group of people that you really, really trust that you can bounce ideas off so that if you're worried about bringing stuff up to your executive, you've got in there first and have worked out, you know, the stuff that you're going to say. But I think curious assistants, assistants who ask questions, who really understand the business, who really understand the executive's goals are going to be the most useful because you're going to see where you're able to add value rather than just waiting to be told what to do. Excellent. Thank you. I'm, every once in a while, I, I'm listening to you and every once in a while I glance over the chat, seeing if there's anything I want to build on now. But um, there's too much. There's a lot. I think if they're looking at really practical ways, not yeah. um, of, of stepping up. I would say, and I'm going to tell a very quick story now because I think it kind of puts it into perspective. I don't know if they are familiar with a lady called Anne Hyatt. Um, if you're not familiar with her, maybe look her up. But she was the chief of staff at Google. Um, and prior to that, she looked after Marissa Meyer. And prior to that, she looked after Jeff Bezos at Amazon. So she's a really, really high powered assistant. But she said when she first went to work for Jeff Bezos at Amazon, um, she used to go to meetings with him all the time and he employed somebody every year who he called the shadow and the shadow was employed every year to follow jeff bezos around if you don't know who jeff bezos is by the way he's the top guy he's the most he's the richest man in the world and he owns amazon but he employed somebody he called the shadow and the shadow was employed to follow him around to work out how he thought to really get inside his head so that god forbid if anything happened to jeff there was somebody there who would be able to follow on in the way that he thought. And every year a new shadow arrives. And after they're finished that year, they go off and they take over a part of the business. And there's loads of them now. But Anne said she was six months through her first year when she suddenly realized that she was the shadow also. Because every meeting that the shadow was in, she was in too. And she said it totally changed her career because she suddenly realized how much she could learn from her executive if she just listened to him. The other thing she told me is that the very first day she worked for him, she walked into his office and he had a newspaper and two books on his desk and she went out and bought them. And from then until the last day she worked for him, she bought everything that he bought into the office as reading material because it meant that they always had something to talk about and they were always on the same page. How smart is that? But, you know, I talked to Anne about the things that she said because I interviewed her um, for a, a webinar a few um, years back and I talked to her then about things that she felt we really should be doing as assistants to step up and she said just volunteer for projects that are really outside your comfort zone there was an occasion when Eric Schmidt the chairman of Google was going off to Israel and she said would you like me to put together a briefing document for you on the history of Israel and then went and researched it and he came back and said that was just so amazing Anne that gave me so many things to talk to Sharon about. And over a period of time, he kept asking her to do more of that. And in the end, she said, well, I can keep doing these really high powered strategy documents for you. But actually, I'm going to need my own assistant because I don't have time to do the repetitive stuff anymore. And so that's what they agreed that they would do. But she says, you know, don't be afraid to get things wrong and get over feeling stupid. No idea right now is a bad idea. And nobody else in that boardroom really understands how to do process. So be the one who's putting stuff forward. Wherever possible, say yes, even if you're not sure how to do it, and then go away and teach yourself. Because actually, 
it empowers you, it pushes you outside your comfort zone. And as I said earlier, if you're in your comfort zone, you're probably not in your right place right now. Stop asking permission. You know, the days of asking permission are gone. You know your superpowers. You know what you're amazing at. Go do it. And actually, I think maybe if you give the repetitive jobs to somebody who is more junior, they would really appreciate that on occasion. It gives them the opportunity to learn themselves. And, you know, if you're indispensable, you're never going to get promoted. So you don't want to do that. Anyway, again, I'm going to shut up. I could talk forever. No. You know I can do that, Joan. <laughs> <laughs> keep going you're the guest today <laughs> it's wonderful we all love hearing it all um another thing we were going to have you share today is some of the global trends you're seeing that are impacting the workplace oh my word well i mean i think that really it's that whole future of jobs thing I mean, I think what's really interesting about the future of jobs report um, and what's good news for assistance <laughs> for a change yeah. is, that, <laughs> is that what it's saying is that, you know, we were all taught that people who could retain facts were really smart and that they would get to the top. Um, well, that isn't how it's going to be anymore. And in fact, we're already seeing that change. And the reason for that is because, of course, if you want to know a fact, you can ask Siri or you can ask Google or whatever it happens to be. So now what is becoming far more valuable within businesses is that whole piece around creativity and creative problem solving and emotion intelligence and, um, you know, being able to think creatively and all that stuff, which are the things that we have been doing as assistants forever and ever. So you are going to have the opportunity to be hugely powerful. You know, we did a piece of research two years ago, I think it was, with Avery, you know, the people who do stationery. Um, and we asked questions of, all the people who worked in offices and it turned out that assistants have the same IQ as everybody else in the office but they had 18 percent more emotional intelligence than anybody else in the office and I think that's really interesting I think um, maybe that's to do with us being the profession that is more full of women than anybody else because it's it's still 98 percent women um, and we've worked out that if it's a fifth of the world's working population working in admin, which is what I think it is, then that works out at about half a billion women worldwide. And you know, if you give a man a contact sheet of 64 photographs of emotions and you ask them to say what the emotions are, they can recognize between 12 and 15 of them. If you look at a woman, if you give it the same sheet to a woman, it's usually between 48 and 56 of them. So. Wow. You know, that to me says why that emotional intelligence piece is excellent. Now, the other thing is that we are coming up to World Administrators Summit. And I don't know whether you guys out there have heard about this yet, but if you haven't, you really ought to go look it up because it's the G8 for you guys. It's the G8 for the administrative profession. And we have our next um, big meeting coming up in August. Now that has 26 countries attending. It's the heads of associations from all over the world. We meet every three years, usually. Um, I chaired it in Papua New Guinea, and I then uh, co-facilitated it in uh, Frankfurt in 2018. And now we are in Wellington next year. But in the middle, in August, we've got a business meeting. Um, and top of the agenda there is career progression and job titles. And this is another really exciting trend, I think, because to me, part of the reason why the profession has such problems is because there isn't a career progression. And we have 162 job titles that we've managed to find so far. Um, so how do you get from one to another to another? So back in Papua New Guinea six years ago, we started talking about this and we sent everybody off to do research. And what happened three years later was that people came back and said, we just can't agree on job titles and job descriptions. Because <laughs> just to give you an example, in the UK, you're either a PA or an EA. A PA is the equivalent of an administrative assistant. And in the States, a PA is somebody who looks after somebody of high net worth. Yes. Um, in Australia, an EA is lower than a PA, and the same in New Zealand. In Europe, it's a management assistant, and then there's everything in between. And of course, there's all those job titles which they've given you because they don't actually want to give you more money or promote you, but they want to join several titles onto your title to make it look like you've got a promotion. So it gets so confusing. And in the UK, certainly, you could be a PA and sitting on the um, 
reception and being called a PA, or you could be looking after the CEO and being called a PA. So to me, we needed to do something different. And so we started doing some work around that. And what we ended up doing was doing a skills matrix. And in that, we came up with five different levels of assistant. So a level one is an entry level and a level five is a supersonic, probably bordering on chief of staff. And we didn't do job descriptions. What we did is we put skill sets between them. And we've had associations all over the world working on this together. Now, what's really exciting is that we're just at a point where we're about to ratify that and to say, yes, that's the way ahead. And obviously, it's a living, breathing document. But what it and it will change as things change, because obviously, you're going to end up doing different things, I suspect, moving forward than you're doing at the moment. But what is really exciting about that is that a no matter where you are in the world and actually working from home you could now work anywhere in the world if you wanted to it's no longer just in your own locality if you say you're a level three assistant everybody will understand what that means a bit like nursing or accountancy or whatever it also means that if your executive is looking for somebody because this is the other thing our research showed is the executives don't half the time know what they need so it's going to mean that they're going to be able to look and go actually that's what I need, a level four assistant. It means if you're going for training, you're going to be able to say, OK, so that training is going to get me from that bit to that bit. Yes, it, it just gives so much clarity. And it means that people entering the profession will see that there is a very, very clear career progression for them. So it turns it from the job into the career, which we all know it is. But the businesses seem to be having a huge problem with catching up with that and understanding that you're no longer there to do the tea and typing. It's like beating my head against a brick wall. Quite often when I go into companies, I start speaking and then they say, could you just come and talk to the executive? And when I talk to the executive for about 10 minutes, they go, oh, yes, of course, that's what we should be using them for. But they didn't get it beforehand. So, OK, I can see there's there's several people questioning and saying what the name of that event. And it's World Administrators Summit. And I will give Joan the link to the website so you can go and take a look and then you'll be able to get up to date with all the papers and what's happening there. All right. Very good. All right. We're at 942. So I know we're going to we want to get into the uh, questions. Um, I know, Lucy, we were going to talk about one other thing about the fear of losing their jobs. But uh, should we do questions? Because <laughs> uh, in our questions and I really want to. I want them to have an opportunity to ask you what they'd like. So um, everyone, and I hope you could stay on for this and stay with us to the end, because I also want to tell you about a special announcement, because Lucy will be speaking at our live virtual conference. So I hope you can stay on until the very end. But Malia, why don't we go ahead and start taking questions? Hi, Malia. Hi, John. Hi, Lucy. Hi, Lucy. Okay, let's get started. So Nancy writes, I support several C-suite executives and five VPs. It wasn't always this way. Our company went through several reduction in force and was giving additional, she was given additional responsibilities. While I accepted the additional responsibilities, my compensation did not increase. I'm the type of person who's shy to request such a request and yet I excel in what I do. I'm loyal, I'm dependable and dedicated. How do I build up my self-confidence and be taken seriously? Okay, so um, I think that you are, A, you just so that you know, it's only one in five now that actually has only one executive and the average is four. So if you've got less than four, then you're doing all right. Um, I think it's a matter of time management, because at the end of the day, if they are paying you, and, and I'm not suggesting for a minute that you sit there and go, that's not my job, because I know that isn't in any of your remits at all. It just isn't who assistants are. But what I would say is if you go back to the time blocking thing and you are putting in time for what you're doing for each person and maybe color code the different executives so that you're sharing that calendar with all your executives so they can see what you're doing. Quite often, because Matt and I, he has his own calendar and I have my own calendar and he has all his tasks and um, projects in that calendar. So when I go to him and I do my, hey, I've had an amazing idea, he goes, hmm, where? 
And he does it in a really nice way, but he shows me the calendar and says, where would you like me to put this in the calendar? And sometimes I say, yay, fab, let's look at it. Um, we can look at it maybe in a month's time. It's not so important. And sometimes I say, well, actually, I think it is important. Let's take that out and we can put you in there. If you have executives who are wanting to be the priority all the time, you need to get them to have a meeting and work out what the priorities are, because that isn't your job to do that. Your job is to do the work that they're telling you to do or to pull them all together and say, can we have a meeting once a week where we're working out what goes into my calendar for the next week and what comes out, you know, because you're being paid a salary for that number of hours. So if you are wanting to increase your salary and have that conversation, that is about, to me, doing a time audit. It's about working out over the period of maybe a month exactly what hours you're doing and what you're spending it on and how that is working for the business and then comparing that against your job description. And the next time you sit down to have, um, uh, I, I always want to call it an appraisal, which is what we call it in the UK. Joan, you might have to help me out there. What are you yeah. calling it? Out there? Perform yes, performance. Yes, your performance review. That's the point at which to sit there and say, here is the time audit that I've done and here is my job description and here is what I'm actually doing. And maybe we could look at um, ways that, my um, remuneration could increase based on the additional work that I'm doing. But I don't think you should ever be scared of doing that. You know, I think it's interesting. Sheryl Sandberg's book, Lean In, which if you haven't read it, you really ought to as a woman working in the marketplace, um, says that I think the figure is something ridiculous, like 66 percent of men will argue when they're offered a pay increase because they see it as a game and they will try and get the pay increase from what they've been offered. Whereas it's something stupid, like only 4% of women because they're worried they're going to be seen as being aggressive. So we've got to get with the program a bit here and just um, not feel scared about having those conversations, especially as here we are again in what can only be described as a mm. recession, really, although obviously we've got the pandemic attached as well. And I'm seeing the same patterns again. I'm seeing you all coming up on my timeline as being let go. And then you're feeling so lucky to have jobs that you're just going with it and doing whatever's asked. It's not on. It's not on. And it won't get you respect. Wow. OK. Um... Sorry about that. I lost my question, G. You're fine. <laughs> okay. Um, Tina says, I am in a startup branch, about 30 employees. Corporate headquarters is not providing corporate boilerplates slash templates for standard office documents. I don't have a marketing background, but having to step up and create and build all these documents, and I don't know where to start. Do you have any suggestions? Vicky Sokol Evans, who is also speaking at the virtual conference, I believe. Is she, Joan? She is, yeah. yeah. Well, Vicky Evans is, oh, as far as Microsoft stuff is concerned, she is the absolute queen. And she has an amazing session on styles, which will totally revolutionize the way you do your documents. And it will allow you to put your branding in there and everything so that you have templates. She, by the way, went and trained Bill Gates's team how to use Microsoft, his team of EAs. And whilst she was there, she put together a travel document for um, Bill and a travel document for um, his wife. And basically, you literally just have one document and you click it and say, I want Bill's version or I want Melinda's version. And it changes it so that it's the way that the other one wants it. She's a genius. Go find her. We'll put her details in there as well. And if you're signed up for the conference, you'll get the training session anyway. Yeah, wow. yeah, he is truly, truly amazing. And yes, she's going to be speaking at our event, the same one Lucy's going to be at. We have a lot of great people. All right, go ahead. Next one for Lucy. Great. Um, Sandy says, how would you suggest being proactive when you're sitting at home out of sight of my exec and trying to figure out how to help him? He's very close to the best with his work. Okay. So... You're sitting at home, you're feeling you're out of sight, you're out of mind. And if you're emailing, then yes, probably. But I would suggest that you do exactly what I said to you earlier, which is to call them up and say, I just sat through this really amazing webinar and the woman reminded me that this is my role, especially at the moment. And so I would like to fix a meeting with you to talk about the ideas I have had in order to realign how I make sure that you are 
the very best that you can possibly be, especially at the moment in the crisis. Take control, you know? I, I wish you would stop thinking about yourselves as support and thinking that you've got to keep your head beneath the parapet and not say anything. Let me tell you something, let me, let me give you one more quick story and I know that some of you are going to need to go shortly. But I work a lot with a guy called Jeff Hoffman, and Jeff Hoffman is the guy that owns Priceline. So if you don't know him, then you um, <laughs> you you kind of do know him. But he says that he tells all sorts of stories, actually, when he's speaking on the circuit. But one of the stories he tells is about going one night to have dinner with a friend of his who was an eminent heart surgeon. And he got there and his friend was doing his calendar. And he said to him, Carl, what are you doing? And Carl said, well, I'm doing my calendar. And he said aren't you worth $500 an hour? And Carl looked at him and Jeff said, you know, if you don't have an assistant, you are an assistant. So in other words, Carl was paying his assistant $500 an hour to do his calendar. How many things is your executive currently doing that you should be doing? Because to me, if your executive is insisting on doing all that stuff, it's almost like they're embezzling from the company. They are paid to do executive things not administrative things. And you are paid to do the administrative stuff. So equally, if you're not doing it, you need to step up and have those conversations. That's what you're paid to do. Nice. Okay. <laughs> no, perfect. I love it. Very perfect. <laughs> okay, Aaron says, interestingly, it appears my input and participation is less welcome now at, than it was a year ago. My executives under a lot of pressure and appears now uh, to now see my previously welcomed input as trying to do his job. I have fewer and fewer tasks to do. Will you please help me to be more understanding of what my executives going through right now? Yeah, he's in meltdown. <laughs> Well, you know, I mean, in all seriousness, you have executives out there right now who haven't got a clue how to deal with this situation, who are under so much pressure, you know. So rather than working behind them and ask permission, work alongside them. Um, there was a girl in my last course who said that her boss um, was at a point where she was so stressed that she was going and locking herself in a room with work to get away from everybody and she didn't know how to help her because everybody was going well where is she what's she doing and I said well go knock on the door and sit next to her with your computer and say I'm just going to sit quietly here and work and as things appear that you think I might do just pass them to me and I'll get on with it and they cleared it down in a day but you know, her boss had been really grumpy and really difficult and really reactionary. But it's purely because they don't know what's going on either. They really need you to take the stuff that is, you know, that they don't know what they don't know. It's what I was saying earlier, you know, when I talk to the executives and you say, well, this is how you could use them, you know, your assistant could lead your entire team to victory if you use them properly they go, oh my word, I never thought about it like that. And when I tell them the Jeff Hoffman story about if you don't have an assistant, you are an assistant, they go, whoa, of course, okay, all right, have it, have the email, <laughs> have the calendar. I actually got on YouTube um, a video that I recorded for Administrative Professionals Day, which was to your executives, which explains how best to use you. So if any of you are unsure about how to do that, maybe go find that link um, and then send it to your executive and say to them, I was recommended this link and I thought it might be a good place to start a conversation with you and see what they say from there. It's worked for a lot of other people. Maybe it'll help you. Yeah. It goes back, Lucy, to the point, it's the dollar value thing, um, which when I'm to talking with executives, they'll brag about how independent they are and I can take care of my own emails and I can do my own calendar and I can do my own travel. This was before COVID because many executives are independent and tech savvy. And I would say, well, I know you can do it. It doesn't mean you should do it. So <laughs> if you, right, if you add up, like let's say that executive spends eight hours a week doing all those little things, which they don't think as much because it's two minutes here, five minutes there. But let's say even setting up your own Zoom meetings takes time. Um, mm -hmm. 
you go to them and you say, okay, that's eight hours that you are utilizing doing all of that and estimated that you're paid X amount of dollars. What does that equate to? Is that really what you should be spending your time on? That's what I tell them. Is that really what you're paid to do? I don't think so. You're paid to impact the bottom line. You're paid to impact the business, not run a calendar. And not that that is a lesser of a skill. It actually takes a lot of brains to run oh, yeah. a calendar appropriately. And they're messing up because they're double booking themselves. They're not looking at, you know, that big picture like a great assistant would look at as we, Lucy and I know, it takes brains to work a calendar. It's not about the technology. Anybody could drop a date in, but a great assistant is going to look at the whole picture of that schedule, right? And where you are and what you're doing. And those are the kinds of things you've got to sell your executives on. It's not the task of a calendar. It's the brains it takes to make that calendar work well. Absolutely. And you know what? Matt and I, I don't touch my calendar. He will kill me if I touch my calendar. And we just have that understanding that how much time does that save me? Because basically, someone comes through, they say, Lucy, can I have a meeting with you? Or can we have a chat or whatever? And I maintain my brand by saying, I would love to, how lovely, but I'm going to copy in Matt on my reply because he will kill me if I play with my calendar. And then underneath the signature somewhere where nobody is ever going to look, I put a number between one and five. Now, if it's a one, you're going to get a meeting with me probably today. If it's a five, it will be a cold day in hell before you get a meeting with me. But that <laughs> that saves all the conversations. It just That's means- good, I like that. I haven't heard that one, Lucy. <laughs> yeah. But I also no. then put- But I also put then a dot and it will say 30 or um, one or um, 15 so that he knows how long I want that meeting for. So what that means is we don't have to go backwards and forwards ever with yeah, those exactly. conversations, which saves me so much time. It's yeah. wonderful. That's what it's about, right? That's really, really good. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'll go have another question, I guess. We can take okay. another one and Okay, uh, Francois is asking if you have any special tips for administrative professionals in the public sector. Oh, my word. Spend your budget. <laughs> what do I mean by that? Well, most public, I, actually, to be fair, I'm not sure whether that's the came, same in the States, but certainly here in the UK, most public um, servants, as they call them, are given specific budget for um, training, and then they don't know where to use it. So use it, go get it. Um, I, don't, it, it. I don't know enough, to be honest with you, about how the public sector works in the States in order to be able to give a comprehensive answer on that. Joan probably knows that sector far better than I do. Yeah, yes, yeah, so we do work with a lot of um, those types of agencies and assistance from those groups. Um, and as far as what's different, basically, I'm, I always teach the same. I don't really treat those assistants any differently. Uh, in fact, it's really interesting. When I first started teaching um, uh, or opened office dynamics, we were living in Virginia Beach, which is heavy military there. Um, and so my first big clients were the Department of the Army and the Department of the Navy which was really interesting because I was brought up in the corporate world. And what they loved is that I wasn't, what I was teaching wasn't black and white. Like the military obviously is very rigid. It's by the rules, you dot every I, you cross every T. And here I was coming in at that time telling the assistants to use color file folders. Like they always use Manila. And I was like, no, you gotta use red means this is a hot item and blue and green. <laughs> And the, the powers to be were like, wow, we love this. Like you're getting them to think outside the box. So, you know, it, I haven't taught anything uh, differently or said anything differently. It's the same, you know, rules that apply. I mean, I think the biggest thing we see the difficulty is the hang up and the lag time in communicating 
with yeah. these different agencies. I know Malia's gone back and forth hundreds of times and gets pushed to other people, and then we got to start all over again. So I just think being as outstanding and timely as you can be with your communications and keeping things moving forward. Um, sometimes I think they get caught in the system, the communications. So um, we're gonna stay on for a few more minutes. I just, I wanna be sure to, to tell everyone something special before some of you have to head off. And if Lucy's okay with five more minutes. Of course. I'm okay with it. But I want to let everyone know, as I said earlier, Lucy is going to be speaking at our, our live event. So our conference, which is October 27th to October 30th, they will be live sessions. So you'll be able to talk and interact with the speakers and we'll have them maybe stay on after their session, which Lucy, I haven't even been able to talk to you about this, but um, in, in the platform that we're using, we'll have the main stage where so Lucy would present in the main room. And then Lucy could go into a session room that we call it if she wants to and is available and spend time with a private group answering questions. Uh, so you could have that private little extra time if you want to do the questions. Um, we're very, very excited about it. Our theme this year, 2020 and beyond. To me, this is going to be the most critical year for conversations about this profession. And some of the things we're going to talk about is, you know, this is really the time that you've got to market yourself and get on yourself and your LinkedIn, but it's not just having a profile on LinkedIn. You have to have a profile that wows people. So we're digging into the nitty gritty of all these things and having your career portfolios in place. Vicki Sokol is going to be there giving us all kinds of tips. Mike Song is going to dig in on organizing your virtual office at home. Um, we've got two, uh, Melba Duncan and Lainey Miller. Lucy, I think you know them. We love both of them. One's on the mm -hmm. East Coast, one's on the West Coast. They run EA search firms. And they've got this great insight, uh, brilliant women. So it's just going to be wonderful. What we want you to know is right now we have our early bird going until August 31st. So the early bird is 395. Um, and then for those of you who are attending this webinar, we'll give you an extra $50 off the early bird if you register before August 19th. And the code is, I've got to read my notes here, make sure I get it right, in all caps, early 50. So hopefully, I really, really hope you can come because to me, like I said, I think this is going to be one of the most critical conversations as we keep navigating this, this world of unknown, you know. So how do you plan for what you don't know? Well, there are strategies, right, Lucy? So, um, anyway, check that out. Go to officedynamicsconference.com and you'll see the agenda. We're going to have networking opportunities where you'll get to talk face to face with assistants from around the world, not just in a chat, but a real room where you're going to get together and you're going to be able to talk and meet and exchange information. All right, let's do you want to take two more questions, Lucy? Are I'm you'll... more than happy. More than happy. Okay. Thank you, Lucy. So I have actually a few people asking the same question. They're all stating that they've recently taken on more responsibility and taken on more with their role and they're supporting more executives and they're asking the best way to go about asking for a promotion or lead admin and um, during their reviews. Yes, I think what I would say to you is even if they love you to bits, they're not interested in what it's going to do for you. They're interested in what it's going to do for them. So you need to treat it as a business conversation and gather information and stats and uh, facts and figures about what it is that you are doing, which is outside of what you're doing currently as an assistant at your level. And look at things where you feel that if you were to get promoted, you would be able to add value. What what would be the things that would um, 
be tasks or projects that you feel you would be able to take on if you moved up the ladder or simply start doing it a little like Anne Hyatt did and start getting out of your comfort zone so that actually you're able to go and say, well, I've already started doing this, this, this and this so that they can see that you're really moving in the right direction to be a proper strategic business partner and that you are adding value to their role by doing that. It makes the conversation far less of a um, a problem, I think, if they can see that you're freeing up their time and you're thinking ahead and you're getting proactive. Matt came to me. Um, he was a PA for really quite a long time. And he came to me and he said, I really, I've been your PA for ages now and I want to be an EA. And I said, well, excellent, good. And he said, so you'll promote me then? And I said, no, <laughs> I won't. <laughs> Because I think there's a real difference between a PA and an EA. And the difference, he said, well, can you explain the difference? And I said, well, OK, let me give you one example. And the, the example I gave him was that as my PA, I might have an email come in that he would um, look at and he would triage for me and he would know which folder to put it in so that I could respond. As my EA, he would probably respond to it on my behalf. He'd still sign it, Matthew, but he would know enough about the business in order to respond on my behalf. So that was one tiny example. But as time went on, we really worked hard on him becoming more and more proactive. And actually, there was one occasion, and I use it a lot when I'm um, training, but it was the moment where I went, yes, he's ready now. And it was a couple of years ago when I was going to go and speak at a really big conference and he had given me my travel plan. Well, most of you will do that, right? I got on the plane, I opened my folder, I've got my travel plan, minute detail, but all absolutely clear and beautifully presented. Then there was a second folder that had all the speakers in it and their biographies and the subjects they were talking on and photographs so that I could look at it and research it on the plane. I hadn't asked him to do it, but he had. And some of you might well do that. But the thing that to me really stood out was that I got off the plane and my phone started pinging. And that was because he had gone onto LinkedIn as me and had written to every single speaker to say, I'm really looking forward to meeting you and I hope I get an opportunity to see you present. Now think what that does to my business because we have people writing for us in the magazine. We have the most amazing seminars and you know, so to have people that are feeling really warmly towards me because I've written a personal message is above and beyond. And I just sat there and thought, yes, he's got it. That's the moment that he's become an EA. So that's my advice. Get out of your comfort zone. Don't ask for permission. Insert yourself into situations where you don't feel that you have any place being and build the role for yourself and then go back and say, here's the value I'm adding and I want to be made more senior. Excellent. That's a great story. I love that. That's yeah. really good. Okay, we'll do one more and then we got to, we'll let Lucy go here. It's 10.07. You've been very gracious staying on some extra minutes with us, Lucy. I love working with you. But I know you, and I, well, and I know you love talking to the assistants and all of that. Other, <laughs> <laughs> we both have the same passion right there. So Exactly. Uh, we'll do one more. What's the last golden question for Lucy? Okay. <laughs> Megan is wanting to know if you have any suggestions on how to take over a calendar for an executive that uses a paper calendar? Oh, kill him. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Who uses paper anymore? But yes, yes. Come on, Mrs. Brady, get yourself together. Oh, man. Um, <laughs> so my thought is that, especially now, it's a really good opportunity to do that because if you're working remotely, then you can't use paper calendars anymore, right? So maybe that's the suggestion. Maybe the suggestion is that you don't know what's going to happen over the autumn. You're concerned you might be working in different places. And actually, now is the time that you would like to show them how you can share a calendar to both of your benefits. Um, and then, you know, show them and talk to them. Tell them the story I told you earlier about how Matt manages my calendar and say, just think, you're not going to have to have conversations anymore. And you're just going to be able to say, Megan's dealing with it and she'll kill me if I do it myself. And that's the total length of that conversation. And sometimes it takes Matt days to organize meetings for me properly. Or if I have a big meeting planned and we've got to rearrange it, it'll take him forever 
to go and contact all those people and get it sorted. But that's all stuff that my head doesn't need to be filled in, which gives me time to make money for the company. So go do it. Go to, go convince them that you think you might all go back into lockdown in October and that actually now's the time to have those conversations. Yeah, very good timing, right? How could you even do a, um, that right now, the paper calendar, unless you were physically in an office to learn, <laughs> even then that would be horrible. <laughs> yeah. Horrible, can't imagine that. <laughs> all right, yeah. you see, well, I'm a, you know, we all hate to see you go, um, but thank you so much for your time. And it was just fabulous to see you. Um, we're looking forward to seeing you at our conference, you know, which isn't too far away. October will be here before we know it. And uh, it's going to be great fun. So um, I just appreciate everyone joining us today. Thank you so much. Take care of yourselves. Stay safe. Uh, check out Lucy's magazine, Executive Secretary magazine. It's amazing. It's uh, filled with just great usable information. Um, and I love, Lucy, the variety of um, authors you have and contributors to it. They touch on all facets um, of, of the spectrum between business and the profession. You know, it's that good myth. Including Joan, by the way, who is also on our editorial board. Thank you and has been since issue one. <laughs> Gosh, that's how long ago? <laughs> 10 years, Joan, 10 years. That, that, that's a drop in the ocean for how long you've been serving. <laughs> oh, can we go back? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, take care, everyone. Thank you so much, Lucy. Thank you again. Um, and Lucy, if you can hang for a minute, I don't know if we'll be able to stand with you or not, but if we lose no. you, we'll talk to you soon. Okay. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody. <laughs>